Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this little montage of my morning in my sketchbook. I have recently switched to spending time in my sketchbook versus spending time in my journal in the mornings. I tend to find that a little bit more relaxing, more natural, more self-expressive. I sometimes get stressed when I journal because I have maybe layered too many expectations on journaling or I have to write a certain number of pages or I get distracted because oftentimes my mind works faster than my hand can um, write down the thoughts that I'm thinking. And so art has a much more calming effect on me and is much more helpful for setting myself up for a really good day. Here I'm doing just a basic still life painting in my sketchbook in watercolor and gouache of a pear. <laughs> Hopefully you can tell that it's a pear. Um, and a lot of times I use my sketchbook just to take the pressure off of my artistic creation, my sort of quote unquote serious work I do in oil painting on canvas um, and a lot of times the ideas that I generate in my sketchbook make it to the canvas in a more complete Reading and taking notes on the Bible is part of my morning routine most mornings. I don't always get out my big study Bible and my computer and take notes. I had a bit more energy and I was in the mood for it this morning. A lot of times I do read the Bible off of my phone and it is part of my faith practice as a Christian, but I would also advocate it for any student of literature to make themselves familiar with the stories and figures of the Bible. I would consider the Bible sort of required reading for students of literature, especially if you're doing American or British lit, because obviously there are so many books that refer to the Bible or make allegories or, or make use of really famous uh, characters from the Bible. One of my favorite resources for this type of information is actually a podcast called The Bible Project, and I would recommend this both to Christians and to non-Christians or students of literature because it's not meant to be evangelistic in nature. It's not sermons. It is the closest thing that I have found to what is literary analysis, but of specifically biblical literature. So it's a great podcast to have to look up maybe topics or stories that are relevant to what you're studying and uh, just enjoy that amazing resource. Let me give you a little bit of a reading update and what's going on with me. The most recent video that I posted was talking about reading for entertainment versus reading for understanding, and I was using Mistborn as an example. And I think you can hear the conflict in my perspective on the book, even in that video, um, because I kept saying like, oh, I really like it, I really like it, and then going on to be like very critical of the book. And so I read the first book, the second book, and I got halfway through the third one in that trilogy. And I think for me, the problems that I had with the book continue to 
through and um, it no longer was good enough to compensate for the issues that I was seeing in the more of like almost the composition of the book and then I tried Robin Hobbs really famous fantasy series after that I read the first two books in that and after that I hit a huge reading slump and part of I think what was happening there is I was trying really hard to read and enjoy books that I know a lot of people read and enjoy and I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad about liking the books that they like at all but if it's not what captures your attention and interest and it's not what you enjoy then you're not going to enjoy reading it it's just that simple and I don't know if it's my personality I I should say I know that it's my personality where I become much more highly attuned to the wants and needs and desires of other people and I um, have a harder time being attuned to the wants, needs, and desires that I have internally for myself. And this is something that I'm working on and I think is really important uh, for everybody to develop, but to really honor those, uh, to honor those desires. So I have switched back. I'm trying to be really, really good about listening to what my inner voice is saying, which is that I love and want to read classic books. I've always had this ambition to read Mortimer Adler's list. So I have kind of like a combo goal going right now, which is that I have a shelf of books that have, have been unread that I have owned for a really long time. So I'm working my way through those. And some of those happen to also be on Mortimer Adler's list. Some of them don't. So I'm going to get through the books that I own. Uh, and either I'm going to decide, yes, I'm going to read this book, or I'm going to give it a good college try. And if I, it's just not the book for me, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, unhaul that and get rid of it, get it out of my collection. So that's where I'm at with my own personal reading goals. And right now I'm actually reading The History of Rome by Livy. Uh, this particular publication has the first five books of Livy's history. Apparently he wrote 35 books going from the earliest stages of Rome's history of like Romulus and Re Remus and Aeneas and all of that all the way up to his contemporaries, which he was um, living a little bit during that transition from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Uh, we have 10 books existing and this particular publication has the first five books and I've actually really been enjoying it. I thought I had read only parts of it for a humanities class that I had to take for my uh, classical degree, my degree in classical studies. And um, as I'm getting further into this book, I'm realizing I have annotations all the way through it. So I must have read the whole thing, but I totally don't remember any of the content. So I'm glad that I'm apparently rereading it. Um, it's been very enjoyable to read. I think Livy's writing style is definitely a dedication to the narrative, more so than a dedication to the ins and outs of, you know, historical controversy or his resources or what, you know, I don't know. I, I recently read Herodotus relatively recently. I finished it at in like January or February of this year. And Herodotus has so many like offshoots and off trails and tangents. And then he kind of circles it back to his main sort of historical through line. Um, whereas like Olivia is really on topic. <laughs> he does not get too distracted. And on one level, you can perceive the way in which he is perhaps oversimplifying the events. And certainly it seems to me that he's oversimplifying the major characters, um, the consuls or the tribunes or the major players at the time. And so that is definitely happening. But I think what's most interesting to me is that overall you can see there's this real tension as he's exploring the politics of this early phase. On the one hand, he has a real strong tension and fear of, you know, monarchy turning into tyranny. And the first book is really dedicated to those early monarchs of Rome be before they transitioned to the Republican form of government. But on the other hand, once they transition to the Republican form of government, you can see a real fear of mob rule kind of coming to the surface. And these two fears are really pulling the Roman politics in two different directions. And throughout the various conflicts that they have and wars that they fight, like this conflict between the 
the fear of tyranny and the fear of mob rule kind of dictates everything that's happening politically within the city. Um, and so that's really interesting. He talks a lot about the rule of law, but in this context, it's really to to tamp down the power of the of the commoner so that they don't become this wild mob that's out of control. And I think, you know, for me as an American living in, you know, obviously the Democratic Republic of America, you know, we look back to the Greek and Roman forms of government with like rose colored glasses and this real sense of awe, uh, which obviously like huge influence on our own development of our political system. Um, but there's a real difference in flavor in the way that they talk about the common man, because there's a real fear of the common man having too much power in the Roman Republic, as expressed at least by Livy. And that's just not part of the American ethos. And I found that very surprising uh, and, and unexpected. I don't, I don't know why I find it so surprising and unexpected. Maybe it's because I expected them to have a more American approach, which is like the defense of the common man at all costs, you know. And so I don't know. It's just been a very interesting, interesting reading experience, and it's interesting to see that difference. so much for joining me on this particular Saturday where I did some art, some reading, and then some more art. And I'm going to let you finish off the rest of my painting and I will see you in the next one. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.